Greetings, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Harvard Catholic Forum. I am Deacon Tim O'Donnell, Program Director here, and I'm delighted to welcome you, uh, both those with us here in person at Harvard and our virtual audience joining us through Zoom. The mission of the Harvard Catholic Forum is to share the riches of Catholic thought and culture with the academic, artistic, and professional worlds of Cambridge, Boston, and beyond. In addition to our lectures, we offer non-credit courses and are continuing to broaden our programming. The Forum is a project of the Harvard Catholic Center, St. Paul's Parish, Harvard Square, and the St. Paul's Choir School. Together, we make up a vibrant Catholic presence in the midst of the Harvard campus. Check out our website at harvardcatholicforum.org where you can sign up for our newsletters and register for future events. And please consider supporting our important mission by making a financial contribution. For tonight's event, we are thankful for the co-sponsorship of the Lumen Christi Institute at the University of Chicago and the Abigail Adams Institute here in Cambridge. Please note this event, like all of our public lectures, will be archived on the Harvard Catholic Forum YouTube channel. If you like what you see and hear, please share the link to that channel with friends, colleagues, parishes, or chaplaincies that may be interested. Our post-talk YouTube participation always exceeds the numbers we are able to reach on day one. Before I introduce our speaker, let me give you a roadmap of tonight's event. The lecture segment will last 30 minutes or so, and we will have an opportunity for some Q&A. Those of you who are here in person should uh, will receive a note card and pencil. Um, and if you have a question, please write it on the card. Uh, at about uh, 7.30, one of our student fellows will come up the aisles to collect the cards and give them to me. I will pass on as many of the questions as I can. Unfortunately, we are not set up technically to take questions from our virtual audience at the same time. Our speaker tonight is James Hankins, professor of history at Harvard and an internationally recognized authority on Renaissance humanism. He received his PhD from Columbia, has written widely on the intellectual and cultural history of the Renaissance, and serves as general editor of the Kentucky Renaissance Library. Among his numerous authored and edited books, translations, and articles is the recent Virtue Politics, Soulcraft, and Statecraft in Renaissance Italy, Harvard University Press, 2019. Uh, I have a list of some recent essays of Professor Hankins that are related to the topic of this lecture. They're here, you can pick them up at, at the end of the lecture, uh, and they will also be, uh, there'll be a link to them on the archive uh, of this talk. So please join me in welcoming Professor Hankins, who, ex who explores Christian humanism in the Renaissance, a model for us today. Thank you, Jim. Um, I, I wish you had had the opportunity to talk at the top of the end of the model for us today. It's, a, it's not uh, quite clear to me that, that uh, this is possible, but we'll talk about that in the lecture. Um, so I'm going to try to make two points in this lecture. Uh, the first is that the Renaissance the deeply Christian period of Western civilization, uh, one that in many ways uh, is more Christian than the Middle Ages, I hear a sharp of the breath, as Catholics are taught that the Middle Ages are our period. But nevertheless, I want to say that the Renaissance is a deeply Christian period. Uh, and you can argue, I think, that in some ways it's more Christian than the Middle Ages. Uh, the Renaissance could be described as a period whose educated elites uh, were devoted above all to the restoration of Christian classical civilization. That's the first point. The second point I'm trying to want to make is that the Christian humanists of the Renaissance can offer us a model 
for how we could restore our own civilization, which I think many of us would agree is in desperate need of restoration. Two points are related for reasons that I hope will become obvious if they're not already obvious. So the first point about the deeply Christian nature of the Renaissance, it's not really controversial among scholars. Can you all hear me? Yes. This room has great acoustics with my experience. So uh, if you have problems, just you know, up, roll up some paper in a ball and throw it at me. And <laughs> realize that I'm not getting it across. But so this, this point about the Renaissance being a great, deeply Christian period is, is not in, in contest among scholars. It will be controversial only if you get your information about the period from the entertainment industry, from popular novels like the Da Vinci Code, or if you learned about the Renaissance from textbooks written 50 years ago, uh, some of which are still in use. Um, we all know that um, what the Hollywood image of, 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 of the Renaissance is. Uh, Hollywood's most popular novels revel in their Medici's and their Borgias, whose vast wealth and lust for power are matched only by hypocrisy, cruelty, and sexual excess. Uh, this is the Hollywood view, mind you. From the, the, from the Medici's and the Borgias, whose sins are gleefully exaggerated and whose virtues are utterly forgotten. It's an easy step to find in Niccolo Machiavelli, uh, the most characteristic voice of Renaissance politics. Tens of thousands of college, college lecturers have relished introducing callow undergraduates to his cynical analyses of power and politics, believing that they are revealing through him how the world really works. Machiavelli advises his princes to learn how not to be good, that's a quote, how in the right circumstances committing fraud, crushing enemies or allies, and manipulating religious superstitions can advance a ruler's interests. What students can fail to hear old Nick's word whispered in the ears of young of their Medici patrons uh, as a revelation of the Renaissance's dark secret soul? Well, okay, I, I'm, I'm making fun of this, this point of view, uh, but if you can unglue your eyes from the TV for a while and, uh, and walk into a museum, uh, you might start to wonder about the Hollywood image. Uh, what you see in a museum is likely to be th things like this. If you're lucky, Raphael, Verrocchio, Michelangelo, uh, who uh, are devoted to producing great religious art. Almost everything these artists produce is religious art. Uh, the great 19th century historian of the papacy, uh, Ludwig von Pastor, once estimated that well over 90% of all Renaissance art is Christian religious art. There's a very small, it's probably more than that actually, there's a very small amount of, of Renaissance art that is devoted to secular subjects. Uh, there would seem to be a kind of disconnect between the material remains of the Renaissance, its artistic products, and the popular view of the Renaissance today. Justify my loss of mask, by. <laughs> So if you studied the Renaissance a long time ago, or you study a textbook written a long time ago, uh, most textbooks, in fact, don't keep up with scholarship, but scholarship and textbooks is often many years out of date. Uh, you may have encountered something historians call the secularization narrative. Anybody who follows the news today knows that journalist narratives are, are uh, major weapons of ideological and political warfare. But we historians have our narratives too, and they often uh, have a kind of ideological edge to them. So the, the secularization narrative of modern Western history, which basically goes all the way back to Voltaire and the Enlightenment, presents the history of Europe and America since the Renaissance as a process of gradual secularization, leaving religion, particularly dogmatic religion, behind. So according to this narrative of the West, um, the, the West gradually, through a process of rebirth, Renaissance, and Enlightenment, enters the modern age of freedom, individuality, and progress. That's the, that's the glorious secularization narrative of the modern West. Uh, so uh, in the case of the Renaissance, this narrative is put about 
uh, by one of the great historians of the 19th century, the Swiss uh, historian Jakob Burkhardt, uh, who in, 19, in 1816 uh, called uh, the Italians of the Renaissance the firstborn among the sons of modern Europe. So uh, Renaissance is the beginning of the secularization process, according to this very old and outdated view of the Renaissance. So uh, the firstborn among the sons of Europe set Europe on a path of, of finding a utopian future led by Thomas More, uh, in this context usually referred to as sir rather than saint. So most historians today don't accept the secularization narrative according to which the Middle Ages represents the apex of Christian influence in Western civilization. Uh, the famous French historian Jean de Lumont, uh, you can probably tell which one he is just because he looks really French. Uh, <laughs> the third, third figure here, Jean de Lumont, uh, who was a professor at the Collège de France, uh, wrote a famous study called Catholicism between Luther and Voltaire in 1971. This is and he has a lot of very interesting uh, concrete measures of the degree to which um, a society is Christian or not. So he traces the arc of Christianization Europe from the Middle Ages to the 19th century. And his conclusion is that the high point of Christian um, practice, the high point of influence of Christian authorities in, in life, uh, actual lives, comes in the later 17th and early 18th century. It doesn't come in the Middle Ages. So the secularization narrative has Christianity going down, you know, to, the, to modern times, starting in the Middle Ages and having its peak in the Middle Ages. And De Lumo, and I think most historians now understand that, that, <clears throat> that Christian, the Christian religion is becoming more and more uh, dominant in Europe uh, from the 13th century through the late 17th century. And of course, it's pumped up. Uh, Christian confessions are, are pumped up by the Reformation and all sorts of other things. It's really not until the late 19th century uh, that the de-Christianization starts to set in in Europe. Uh, and even more recently in the United States, I think it's really the last 20, 30 years in the United States. So um, the period of the Renaissance, as he argues in his other great book, The Civilization of the Renaissance, 1968, was, if anything, more Christian than the Christian Middle Ages. Okay, so the central evidence for the secularization thesis, uh, as far as the Renaissance is concerned, was the, the movement of thought that historians call humanism. Now, humanism is a word thrown around a lot. People uh, use it a lot without really understanding its historical basis. But from the 19th century through the 20th century, Renaissance humanism is thought to be the progenitor of modern humanism, that there's a continuous line from the Renaissance to modern humanism. Humanism today is widely understood uh, in the general culture as, by definition, non-religious, right? Or as a substitute for religion. Uh, we have a humanist chaplain, as you probably know, at, at Harvard, who is, I think, now the university, uh, the university uh, 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 um, preacher. I think is our first university preacher who's actually an atheist. Uh, but nevertheless, the modern humans understood this way. Uh, Europeans and Americans, the idea is that European and, and American least to some extent also lost their faith in the 19th century. And they felt that all society was going to come unglued without obedience to Christian dogma to hold it together. So some new source of moral authority was needed. Uh, thus, the modern humanist movement tries to base morality in the dignity of human nature, above all the rationality of human nature, uh, shorn of its religious orientation. And if you look at the existentialism in the 1940s and 50s, this is, it's a form of humanism in which uh, we try to create values for ourselves without any kind of spiritual orientation uh, and just relying only on human nature. So that's the modern idea of humanism. But this idea of humanism is very far from the Christian humanism of the Renaissance. Renaissance humanism is, uh, is in part about humanizing Christianity, uh, which the Renaissance humanists felt could use some humanizing, uh, and also about civilizing religion in general, making it less competitive with other religions and, and more, uh, more ecumenical, for, for example. Uh, it's also about fighting the corruption of Christian authorities, uh, the Renaissance, I say, is a very Christian period, uh, but it's not 
I, 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 I'm warned to say the Catholic Church is not in great shape during the run, it's a very corrupt institution, very wealthy and corrupt institution. So a lot of these humanists are interested in reforming, reforming uh, the Christian religion. Probably the most famous one is Erasmus and St. Thomas More, right? Reforming uh, Christian culture. And then thirdly, um, Christian humanism in the Renaissance is about rebuilding a sound civic culture based on virtue, wisdom, and piety. And the leader of this movement, the real founder of the movement, was uh, Francesco Petrarca, who was Petrarch in English, uh, who is the one who really puts together the humanities for the first time uh, as his instrument of, of reform. So the humanities as a cycle of disciplines, consisting of grammar, or philology, uh, elo eloquence, uh, rhetoric, history, poetry, moral philosophy, this cycle of disciplines created by Petrarch and his followers as an instrument of reform, a way to reform uh, Christian society uh, and to transform the souls of the leadership class above all so that they uh, are able to exercise power well. Um, so the careful distinction that modern scholarship makes between modern humanism and Renaissance humanism is primarily the work of uh, my teacher, uh, Paul Oscar Christeller, the great 20th, greatest Renaissance scholar of the 20th century. Uh, Christeller was an expert, he was the expert on Renaissance humanism, uh, and he issued a major body blow to the secularization narrative in what is now known among historians as the Christeller thesis. So grasping the clear distinction between the two species of humanism uh, is a central in insight Christeller repeats over and over and over again that modern human is not Renaissance human. They're different animals. They have the same name. And many, many, many scholars today don't even want to use the term humanism for what's going on in the Renaissance. Uh, my friend Chris Valenza at uh, Georgetown, uh, sorry, he's now at uh, Johns Hopkins, um, wants to use, just use the term literosity, right, rather than humanist. And that maybe is a good idea. Anyway, um, the context for this is uh, that Chris Steller was a Jewish refugee from Nazi Germany. Uh, he arrives at Columbia in 1939, uh, where he found himself at the epicenter of the American humanist movement. This, this is a powerful movement that got going in the 19, well, it's actually um, it comes from the split in the Unitarian Church. One, one branch of the Unitarian Church goes completely atheistical, and they declare themselves the American humanist movement. Uh, his colleagues, Christeller's co uh, colleagues in the philosophy department are uh, participants in this movement. Uh, John Herman Randall, uh, who, like his mentor John Dewey, had been a signer of the Humanist Manifesto in 1933. Uh, another colleague is Corliss Lamont, who is off the author of a book called The, uh, the Philosophy of Humanism, uh, which uh, traces the origins of modern secular humanism back to the Renaissance. Okay, so he has this whole uh, secularization narrative. Uh, the book actually went through many, many editions, and uh, there was a time, I'm not sure this is still the case, when you join the American Humanist Movement, they send you a copy of Corliss Lamont's book on the philosophy of humans. So um, anyway, when Chris Teller began to develop his famous definition of humanism in the 1940s, one of his goals is to clarify that Renaissance humanism is a completely different animal for modern secular humanist humanism. For Christella Renaissance, uh, humanism was a literary, not a philosophical movement. It was a movement populated by believing Christians uh, and not atheists, crypto pagan, proto secularists, or enemies of the church. He also denied that there is any genetic relationship between um, Renaissance humanism and uh, its later. Uh, later uh, devotees of the same name. Insofar as humans make use of philosophy in their literary writings, they are eclectic, borrowing from ancient philosophers. Um, although there are some figures in this movement who do toy with pagan uh, imagery and language, most of the humans are painfully eager to show uh, the compatibility of ancient philosophy and classical civilization generally with Christian belief. Okay. So that's the pars to screw ends, we say, trying to show you what Renaissance humanism is really about, why the Renaissance is a, is a, is a Christian civilization, 
as part of Christian civilization, Christian classical civilization, I, I would like to call it. So now I'm coming to my second point, which is that the Christian humanist of the Renaissance can offer a model for how we can restore our own civilization. Okay, the Renaissance conception of humanism as a form of education that perfects our human nature, uh, including its religious nature, uh, is one that Catholics and Amer Americans generally, I think, should welcome. Uh, it has some cures, I think, for some of the diseases that are infecting us right now. But I'm sure we're all aware one of the great diseases of modern America is destructive and bitter partisanship, hyperpartisanship, I would call it, which has affected every area of our public life and has reached an almost intolerable pitch with the political combat that has broken out in recent years over public education and over government policies regarding the pandemic. Hyperpartisanship can be distinguished from normal democratic partisanship by certain features. It's a legitimate form of partisanship in democratic societies, but what we have now is not that. Hyperpartisanship, uh, hyperpartisans live in bipolar bubbles to cut off from rival claimants to politi political authority by uh, mutual incomprehension and mutual revulsion. Hyperpartisans are dogmatic, intolerant, unable to sympathize with alien points of view. Opponents, their opponents are demonized, their reputations are destroyed by any and all possible means. Democratic deliberation becomes impossible, political deal making, uh, the normal business of interest group politics and, and pluralist societies is despised as an intolerable violation of political principle. So politics turns into a battle between non-negotiable demands and compromise becomes impossible. Uh, so when the results of democratic procedures such as elections go against hyperpartisans, they question their legitimacy. Instead of transactional politics, hyperpartisans engage in resistance, a word linked historically to the struggle of partisans against fascists in the Second World War. Um, Hyperpartisans are any government, sorry, hyperpartisans see any government under the control of their opponents as an enemy occupation. They themselves constitute the true government, government exile, if they're out of power. Uh, members of resistance groups don't accept electoral results, but engage in coups and conspiracies and encourage violence. They debauch justice, corrupt journalism, instrumentalize academic research in their scramble for power. History, my own discipline, turns into partisan storytelling, no longer critical, fair, or conscious of anachronism. The result is that journalism, scientific research, court proceedings, historical writings are distrusted by those outside the hyperpartisan bubble, uh, it reduces them. So, rational means for settling disputes between contrasting beliefs become discredited. Okay, so. That's my analysis of hyperpartisanship. Um, but I think one clear source of hyperpartisanship that we have today is the lack of a common civic culture that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, the universities and, and uh, hyper progressives in general, and their eagerness to celebrate diversity and maximize freedom and equality, have I think neglected uh, the need for common meanings and purposes in any polity, the need for agreed upon standards of good and evil, and agreement about the common good. Some Catholic thinkers today, including some of my colleagues and, and former students, uh, also fault the economic uh, system, economic liberalism of, of the right, the hesitancy of many so-called conservatives to use public power and public resources to curtail obvious public evils like poverty, pollution, child pornography, and the sale of harmful drugs. Uh, both varieties of liberalism are destructive of the kind of solidarity needed for any form of communal life. Uh, I suppose people in this room are aware of, of this kind of post-liberal sentiment among Catholic thinkers uh, today in America. Um, there's a very good substack if you are subscribed to substack called the post-liberals, which is uh, which has some of the leading figures. Uh, very interesting, uh, very interesting substack. 
Um, anyways, there's some commentators like Yuval Levin, who's not a post liberal. Um, well, maybe he is a kind of post liberal, but uh, Yuval Levin, you know, is a famous uh, Jewish um, writer uh, on that kind of uh, sensible conservative right. Uh, he said that the only thing that would really rebuild cultural and political solidarity in America would be another great awakening, right? something, another revival of Protestantism that could rebuild the kind of civic Christianity that sustained the American polity in its first two centuries. So what I'm suggesting here is, is a different approach. Uh, I also think that religious revival would do a tremendous uh, good for the American polity, but my suggestion is that persons of goodwill should back a different kind of awakening, a revival of the kind of civic and humanistic education that was promoted by Renaissance Christian humanists. So um, it's the type of education, uh, mutantis mutantis, uh, that's actually being revived in America today into the main classical education. And I can talk about the difference between modern classical education and Renaissance classical education. Uh, if you'd like, in the, in the Q&A, because there are some differences, but I think there are also large similarities, because uh, classical education is very much focused on character education, which is the same thing that the Renaissance humanities were supposed to produce, right? Good character, wisdom, and piety. So um, this classical schools have made enormous strides, especially in the last several years. Uh, I went and talked to uh, Rob Jackson of Great Harm Arts Academy a few months ago, and I I had a research assistant uh, named Olivia Gluntz, who's one of your compeers, who helped me a great deal. And I recently calculated that the number of students involved in brick and mortar charter schools, uh, not charter schools, but classical education, is around 750,000 people in America now doing classical education uh, in some form or other. The federal school age, public, we're talking you know, high school, right? Uh, K-12 education, we're not talking college, here. we're talking K-12 education. So there are about 50 uh, million uh, high school age, or sorry, uh, school age uh, people, population in America. So this is a growing movement. There, there's a pretty serious uh, part of the, uh, of the uh, college, school age population that's getting into classical education. It includes about 220 classical charter schools, about 250 of, of the 6,000 Catholic parochial schools in the United States, about 250 of them are classical schools. There are about 300 Catholic and other Christian private schools as well, uh, and some hybrid schools. The total number of classical schools in America is currently about 885. That's the top number we came up with. Uh, probably more now because there are new, new ones being founded uh, every day. Um, then there are homeschoolers who are following the classical curriculum, uh, which Rob Jackson estimates conservatively to be about a quarter of the homeschooling population, which is now around 5 million in this country. Uh, so the number of school children who are engaged in classical education already has more than doubled in the last two years. Uh, and the movement, as I say, shares many goals with classical education in the Renaissance. I've been trying to write about or trying to connect the modern classical education movement with the Renaissance forebear in a column I'm writing for first things these days, called they're not by literary, uh, reborn letters. Uh, and so I started this in October and I'm doing one of mine. So uh, if you're interested, you can, you can look at first things and find, I think they're free. Uh, they I'm not really sure actually, but I think they're free online. You can, you can look at them. So anyway, um, Uh, what counts as classical education, of course, is somewhat different from classical education in the Renaissance. What Renaissance humanists proposed was itself uh, a training in classical languages, rhetoric, eloquence, the study of literature, above all, poetry, history, and moral philosophy, which were thought to ennoble and strengthen character and make people have a common uh, purpose and loyalty. Uh, and these were called the study of monotopsis, which is where we get the, the, the term humanities from. Right? The humanities are invented in the Renaissance. A lot of people don't really realize this because the liberal arts and the humanities tend to get confused in our parlance. But the liberal arts are much older. They're created in classical antiquity. Uh, the seven liberal arts were formed in the early fifth century. 
by, by Christians who were trying to decide which part of the ancient classical idea, ancient uh, education they should take with them uh, into Christian society. Um, so the liberal arts uh, are, are something different. Uh, they are trying to build powers of expression, uh, knowledge of practical mathematics, rational analysis, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, right? Uh, and the studio humanitantes are more transformational. The goals were more transformational. They weren't just about learning to read old books in school. Uh, they were about absorbing moral and intellectual formation uh, uh, from the ancients, the information that human beings needed, uh, information is a long word, uh, formation that uh, human beings needed to live successfully in civilized societies. So the humanities inculcate mores, manners, good manners, learned informally in the family and the school. It includes the customs of the community, practices like those associated with marriage, with taking meals together, with showing reverence for elders, with other rituals associated with festivals and funerals, and with military service. And uh, moral intellectual excellence is also supported by what I call the virtuous environment. Uh, physical spaces recalling in their architecture and decoration the nobler role of classical uh, Greeks and Romans, uh, even soundscapes filled with music that claim to be reviving ancient music. There's a classical music revival in the 15th century as well. Not that they knew anything about classical music, but they imagined what it might, what it might be like. Uh, so the humanists and artists inspired by them created a whole culture designed to reshape the soul modeled on an idealized classical antiquity. Here's a picture, by the way, if you ever go to Florence, you go to the Palazzo Vecchio, which is the government building of old Florence. Um, it became a Medici palace, but originally it was the government building built in the late, very late 13th century. So if you go into the, into the hall where they have debates, uh, you see on the wall this, this uh, fresco of Pirandaio, uh, where he's putting the noble Romans on the wall but with an inscription beneath it, there's text, so that the governing uh, signoria, the govern governing lords of Florence, uh, the butcher, the bakers, and candlestick makers, whose names are picked out of bags and who, who govern Florence, that they can look on the uh, on the wall of their palace and see what they're expected to do. Uh, when they go into the chapel, uh, they have a chapel in the signoria. Also, they, the chapel is just loaded with classical quotations that they're meant to. Understand. So this is part of the virtuous environment. So what I'm saying here is that um, uh, one reason why a revival of this kind of humanistic education can prove helpful in modern America is that it's not religious education, but it's nevertheless constructed in such a way as to be compatible with and indeed supportive of religious belief. Uh, it's not like modern humanism, which is trying to destroy religious belief. Uh, so Renaissance humanism compatible with a certain degree of pluralism does not militantly seek to impose any total identity belief system on students. Classical education can provide an imminent frame, to use Charles Taylor's expression, a common moral language and shared political ideals for a common public world that would nevertheless be open at the top, as it were, to transcendent, uh, to the transcendental uh, uh, to religious belief, did not seek to crush religious nature or restrict our full humanity. It would root us once again in the civilization we have inherited from the past. And uh, instead of ignoring, defaming, and even seeking to suppress that civilization as uh, hyper, hyper progressives or woke education seem to be bent on doing at present. So you, you, the classical education of Renaissance is, is not religious education, but it's designed to be compatible with religion. Here's a picture of Petrarch standing between his lord, Francesco Carrara, and his wife uh, at, a, at a religious service and they're observing a miracle uh, in, in, the, um, in the church in Padua. So by the way, classical education was conceived by the Christian humanists before the Reformation could, in other words, support in modern times a type of education that is secular but does not abolish the transcendent and is not easily turned into a weapon against peoples of faith. The argument is that uh, a modern form of classical education model on the Renaissance conception of humanistic education and culture deserves to be revived and, and, and supported today 
It suits the pluralistic culture we live in, in the modern world, which is not going to change and stop being pluralistic anytime soon, right? Absent the species of ideological tyranny that uh, you would find in uh, the Communist Party of China or uh, the, the Maoist, not, not in modern China so much, but as the Maoist period. Uh, you'd have to have Maoism really to um, to uh, to put an end to the pluralism of modern society. That's those tensions broadly compatible with modern pluralistic societies that may include many religions and sects, as well as persons living a non-religious or secular life. But its focus on supporting the common good makes its efforts effects on the human will centripetal, not centrifugal, uh, unlike the forms of education that have recently sprung up in our schools and universities. Common humanist culture offers resources for moral reflection at a high level, but not dogmas or sacred texts. Humanistic texts are not wholly writ, but the authorities, authorities in the sense of respected voices in our tradition whose words deserve careful consideration. Traditional history, biography, and imaginative literature provide numerous examples of fine conduct, prudent action that can be imitated in the present. Traditional works of literature and philosophy provide a common orientation for social and political life that is rooted in the tr tradition that we inherit from Greeks and Romans, as well as from medieval and modern civilization. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Hankins, and we have um, already a number of excellent questions, but let me kick it off with this one. Um, how much does classical education, contemporary um, classical education, or and to say any classical education, uh, depend on engaging particular authors? And um, must an important part of the curriculum be composed of Greek and Roman authors? We start so slow. I mean, is that because we that's where we go for, for, for virtue, that's where we go for the common good, that's where we go for the civic. Um, uh, does that need to be the anchor, or does it not? Well, I'm, I have a classical education, so I would, I would say that. But uh, it's important to realize that modern classical education, the type of education I've been talking about that's spreading around the U.S. now in uh, classical charters and in homeschooling and hybrid education, that is quite different in terms of its author list. If you want to know what people are reading in these schools now, you should look at Classical Learning Test website, which is run out of Annapolis, Maryland. They they actually give you the um, the the authors upon whom the classical learning test is based, and there are several hundred authors. This is quite different from Renaissance. Renaissance believed in intensive reading, not an extensive reading. Uh, they actually even memorizing certain key texts like Virgil or 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 Cicero, State of Piece. Uh, they, they believe in memorization, which is something common to the Confucian tradition, by the way. Uh, memorization is an important part. Uh, the, the modern classical schools don't do much memorization, as far as I know. Maybe there are some that do. It's a, it's a rapidly changing movement. Uh, but they do, uh, are, they're more ecumenical in their choices of text. They have Confucian texts, they have Buddhist texts, uh, they have the Upanishads, you know, they have all sorts of religious texts from around the world. Uh, the idea is a kind of cultural literacy that's broader than the Renaissance humans would have, would have um, thought, but I, that's a good thing in my, in my, in my view. Uh, I do think that, there, that in our Western tradition, there's a unique position that held by certain texts, like Homer and Virgil, uh, particularly in poetry, and moral texts like Cicero's De Epictes, which is the backbone of moral education in the Renaissance. Um, and uh, Plato, Aristotle, some of these authors that are really, uh, have really determined the way people in the West think and you really understand Western thought apart from them. And I would go down even to authors like Montesquieu or, the, or, or Locke in, in, for the American tradition. Uh, but that's an excellent question. I think that there, there's a very broad um, set of authors now that's part of classical education. But the idea lives that reading these authors uh, does, does it, uh, improve your character, makes you a more thoughtful person, makes you someone who's more grounded, who knows what, what you think, uh, and you're able to resist 
um, resist uh, malevolent, malevolent ideas when they try to take over uh, your 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 space. Thank you. Um, could you comment on the parallels or lack thereof between the humanist revival of classical and patristic learning? Uh, well, the humanists were very interested in patristic learning. One of the things I did mention uh, about the humanist movement is that it was the movement that really um, moved Greek education into the Western classical tradition. So throughout the Middle Ages, there were some specialists who knew Greek, but they didn't teach Greek in the schools. And that's changed in about the mid 15th century. They start introducing, uh, they start introducing study of Greek, but the humanists were very interested in patristics. Uh, translating Greek works into Latin was of primary importance. Uh, the Council of Florence was very influential in the 1430s because this is the period when the Greek Orthodox Church uh, decided to submit to Rome, and the, they later went back on the deal, but, but uh, Rome took it very seriously, and Rome believed that they were now responsible for the Greek, uh, Greek patristic tradition, and they had a major project run on the Vatican Library where they where they translated the works of Greek patristic Greek authors. Uh, they did not have them in schools. There were a few, they, they liked to read the authors, but it was more, it was not, a, they weren't school authors. So they were available in libraries um, and they were cited and read uh, by more mature scholars, but they weren't considered models for, for, uh, for school use, partly because they were, um, uh, they were concerned about the literary value. You can't you really can't um, build up good writing and speaking ability on the basis of translations. They thought you had to really know the original text in order to to build the power of, of speech and the power of of communication, which is such an important part of the humanist tradition. If I would say something that the modern classical school does not pay enough attention to is the humanist interest in communication and powerful persuasive speech. Uh, humanists believe that if you had to use force to run your society or fear uh, that you were failed uh, and that a, a really um, decent society, a, a real republic uh, led by, by virtuous leaders would use persuasion and not force. That's a political idea. Uh, you talked about the uh, classical uh, K through 12 uh, schools movement. Well, what sort of curriculum would you recommend for an undergraduate um, seeking to, uh, that would inspire virtue, morality, and thoughtfulness that would be a, a classical education in that sense? Well, I, I really think that the, the classical school movement is something that's best in the K-12 education. In that university, Education, uh, it, it, you should be reasonably well formed by, by that period, both intellectually and morally. Um, the university, now, as it's now constituted, does not teach the humanities that way. It's a very professionalized discipline. Uh, it's much in, uh, in the languages, it's much more philological. It's about training people. That there's a tendency to treat undergraduates as little, little graduate students and, and to train them in that way, try to teach them uh, theories that would be more appropriate for graduate students. I think that, that before, I think there's certainly courses you could take at, at any university that would be good for you uh, in a moral and intellectual sense. Uh, you have to be very careful about seeking those out. There's also a lot of rather malicious courses, I think, that are, that are really anti that are against our, our tradition and are destructive of the tradition. And that's something that's why I'm very grateful for institutions like Abigail Adams, which does give people some guidance about the kind of course that's really going to, to be good for that, good for their souls, if I can use that archaic word. Um, in an archaic whole... idea, but archaic word. <laughs> <laughs> Not an archaic idea, but that's true. Uh, in a globalized world in which access to the riches of many great traditions and civilizations is greater than ever before, how do we find the canon of classical education? Is there room for another classical tradition of education and literature like Confucianism uh, in your proposal? Yes, I think so. I mean, I teach a course here at Harvard uh, 
which is uh, a comparative course on moral self-cultivation, comparing the ancient uh, Greek philosophers with, with the Buddhists and with Confucian writers of antiquity. Uh, and I think I found this extremely illuminating and valuable. And we should obviously, uh, you know, especially places like Harvard, they're, they're not national universities, they're international universities, you meet all sorts of people. And I think that the classical canon sh should expand it and has in fact expanded. Um, because after all, what we're talking about is literature that has been found to be, um, to be useful over, that's what a canon is. It's, it's books that have been read across centuries that, that centuries of readers, students, and teachers have found to be, um, to be useful in their lives. So that sort of text, one has to be careful obviously, but that sort of text, I think um, uh, it, it certainly should be should be welcomed in our traditions. I think. Um, earlier, you spoke about the association between humanism in the 1940s and 50s, uh, and the 1940s and 50s existentialists. Uh, what do you see as the relationship between uh, humanism and nihilism? Uh, is a certain kind of humanism the answer to nihilism? How does humanism respond to this drive to self-create values? Well, we were talking about Renaissance. I mean, the Renaissance humanism does not does not have its own response. I mean, one point about Renaissance humanism is that it refers to other parts of the globus intellectualis, right? But uh, in, in fact, in, in the Renaissance space, if you will, the cultural space of Renaissance, there are other educational traditions. There are scholastics. The scholastic education continues right through the 17th century. Uh, if you're in a town, say you're in a town like Florence, right, and you want to learn about religion, you don't really have to go to a humanist to find out about religion. So humanists are not trying to replace philosophy. You would go to the local Dominican studio or the local Franciscan studio and you'd study with theologians there. Uh, there's no, there, this is something my, my teacher Chris Feller laid great emphasis on. But there is not a rivalry. Um, well, there, there may be rivalry for, for, for university positions. There's, there's not really a cultural rivalry between humanism and scholasticism, humanism and other forms of education. So uh, I, I think that the humanists would say our job, the, there's a very close association between teachers and texts in the Renaissance. So the humanists are, the literati are going to say, our job is to teach people to speak well uh, to speak clearly, be able to communicate, to be powerful speakers, and to know literature, philosophy, and history. That's our job. That's what the humanities does. Uh, but we're not trying to create a counter uh, cultural uh, philosophy that's going to be able to fight off heresy. You know, in the Renaissance culture, that that's, that's the job of, of religious orders or, or bishops, right? So uh, I, I think in the modern world that the Renaissance students is not going to be are not going to be an opponent of corrupt philosophies like existentialism or secular. There's really existentialism or secular existentialism, but but you know nihilistic philosophies. Uh, I think that humanities gives people a certain um, properly taught gives people a certain uh, character and outlook which would help them which would help them fight against nihilism. Uh, teach them that because one of the things, for example, that humanism is very insistent upon is unchosen obligations, right? That your most famous quote in the Renaissance almost is uh, a quote from Plato, which they know about from Cicero, uh, that we are not born for ourselves alone, but for our family, our 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 our, our neighbors, and our country, right? That this, these are we we have obligations, and and they have a, the whole educational system is built around. Um, turning people into moral and good citizens and good members of families, good members of the community. So uh, I think a nihilism wouldn't have much purchase, basically, on a class, a really classically educated person. Uh, you mentioned early on that um, the Renaissance humanists thought that, Christi that the Christianity of the Middle Ages period before them uh, needed some humanizing. Um, can you say a little more about that? 
Well, um, one of the interests of Renaissance humanism is the uh, exploration of other religious traditions. And um, they were uh, one of the problems that the Christendom had in the 14th century when Petrarch starts the humanist movement is that it's losing. It's losing the war against Islam. Uh, the Christians are kicked out of their last bastion in the Holy Land in 1291, the Battle of Acre, uh, and they feel that they, they're, they're, they're not able to fight against the Islamic uh, tradition. But there's a counter movement to say that we should, that Christianity should not be uh, the enemy of other religions. Uh, we should try to um, understand them, give them proper uh, ordering in the family of all religions. And this is Marzio Ficino, the great Renaissance Platonist. He has a hierarchy, puts Christianity at the top, but, and, uh, and Islam and Judaism, and then down to paganism and so forth. There's a hierarchy of religions. But he's trying to understand religion as a phenomenon. Uh, with a view to making, people, uh, making it possible to have interreligious dialogue. So that's something that got started in, in the 15th century. Uh, that Cardinal Nicholas Cusanus is the first uh, shot in, in this, uh, in this uh, I wouldn't call it battle, it's, supposed to be anti. it's not supposed to be uh, militant, it's supposed to be uh, a battle of understanding. Uh, he wrote a, a work called the Crivatio al Qurani, the, the sifting of the Quran, which he tries to show Muslims that if you read the Quran carefully, you will find all sorts of common truths with Christianity. And then, of course, the next step, the same step in Thomas Aquinas' the next step is to say, now think more carefully about the difference between our religions and, and try to think uh, about how they could be. But the, the approach to religion is less is less of a battle and more of a discussion. Uh, it's more about persuasion and less about, uh, about getting, in, getting into your armor of fashion. Right? That, that's, that's what the hope of, of Christian humanism is in the 15th century. You can call that naive. I mean, someone like Machiavelli would call it naive. Uh, but I think in, in our world, that's more attractive uh, than the idea of, of militancy. Um, let's think about the, the Reformation, though, about the Renaissance humanism, and then uh, the Reformation, you know, Europe sort of descends into a bloodbath. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, certainly, uh, there is a loss of a sense of the common good among leaders. Yeah. Um, is this, uh, is, is there some limitation in humanism that, uh, that allows this to happen? Or is that, is that all happening somehow outside? Uh, the humanist project. No, no, not at all. I mean, Luther was trained as a humanist, right? There's a famous German scholar named Bench Müller, who um, had a famous line, which I always use in my graduate, uh, at my graduate uh, exams. It's, uh, on the humanist was kind of reformation, right? You can't have a reformation without humanism. In a certain sense, that's true, because the historical model, for example, of the humanist is that the antiquity is superior to our benighted times. We have to go back to antiquity. And evangelical Christianity is a desire to go back to the Christianity of the gospel. So there's that movement to the past. Um, I, I think that uh, I, I wouldn't say that humanism causes the Reformation. Uh, it may be a precondition of certain Reformation ideas. I think what I, I, I when I Talk about the Reformation these days. I put much more, much more emphasis on corruption than the historiographical tradition does. The historiographical tradition tends to talk about ideas and you know forces and factors. And I had a, a friend in the Vatican who showed me this model one time, showing that the higher the church taxes in any part of Europe, the more likely they were to become Protestant. <laughs> so this is a in his explanation of why Christ became Protestant. I think what happens really is that humanism is a top-down movement. It's meant to be to convert the leaders of society and to uh, create create change uh, within Christian within the Christian world and to reform uh, reform especially high prelates. The Vatican is very much part of this movement in the 15th century. The Vatican is completely behind humanism, and we have humanist popes like Pius II, several humanist popes. There's one or two that don't support the movement, most of them do. 
It's a top-down movement, and the idea is that the leaders of society are going to be properly educated. They're going to become virtuous. They're going to become wise. They're going to become pious. Thanks, which many of them were not. Uh, thanks to the humanist movement. So what happens is Luther comes along, and Luther starts a populist revolution against against the church. Uh, he starts off as a humanist. He wants. He's a friend of Erasmus. He he's, he reads eagerly the works of Erasmus, who represents the top-down approach, if you will. Uh, Luther uh, gets mad uh, at things that are going on, and he decides to you know to start a movement that's really against the church. He doesn't want to work within the church anymore. He's just tired of, of trying to work within the church. I think the church is just too corrupt, has no chance to reform itself, and so they break out and do something different. Now, as it turned out, the church did have capacity to reform itself and did reform itself in the six, 16th century, and it, it um, you might say divine providence kind of forced the church to re reform itself through the through the Protestant movement. It, it made the church serious enough to realize it had a problem, right? Because the church didn't realize always that it had a problem before the Reformation came along. And the church of the 17th century is a much better church from every point of view than the 15th century church. Uh, but I think that that the most prestigious humanists of the early 16th century, he's Erasmus. He decided to stay Catholic because he didn't like populist uh, uprising. But there are many humanists who did sign, sign up for Luther. And he has a humanist following too. So that's my uh, brief history of the Reformation in terms of the, uh, the, the, the way that human, humanity feeds into uh, the Reformation. But the Reformation is basically a political movement and a theological movement. And the humanities is basically the training for. It's a reform movement, but it doesn't operate at, that, at the level of politics and theology. So it has relatively little to do with the actual outbreak of the Reformation. So moving into the present, do you do you think it's realistic to um, expect that uh, classical education uh, can have an effect on hyperpartisan? Well, this seems implausible in the face of it, and I, 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 I can see what your, where your criticism is coming from. Uh, but again, I think of Petrarch. Petrarch you know, was faced with the same kind of problem in his time. He was someone who tried to, uh, well, tried to throw his lot in with the revolution. You've heard, heard maybe of Cola de Rienzo, maybe because of Wagner's opera uh, Rienzi. Uh, he was a populist firebrand in Rome in the middle of the 14th century. He tried to start a revolution, tried to rise up against the nobility, tried to refound the Roman Empire. That was the part that excited Petrarch. The idea of Roman, the Roman Republic is coming back, and, and Rienzi is going to lead this. And he, he becomes the publicist for Rienzi's movement. But then uh, Rienzi collapses, partly because Black Death breaks out, but also he turns out not to, to be. Um, someone who can be trusted and, so, and the thing that really turns Petrarch off is that Rienzi starts attacking the church. So he, he splits his ways with, he, he parts ways with Rienzi and then he decides that we have a terrible problem here, our culture is terribly depraved, uh, the churchmen are, are incredibly selfish and corrupt and the leaders of society are tyrannical and they're, they're oppressive, that we have to do something about this, but we're going to do this we're going to start with the human heart. And he takes what uh, I think uh, it's a, what, what, what I'm talking about and what, what Petrarch was talking about, it's a long term solution. It's not going to, you're not going to start a classical school and suddenly see America transform. But, you know, now we have maybe 10% people uh, in uh, of countries in, in homeschooling now because of the pandemic, but also the situation in public schools. Uh, that could grow. After 10 years, you have 20% of the people in non-public schools who are uh, following maybe classical schools. You could have see some real changes uh, in the way the society is conducted. This is what happens with the humanist movement. It doesn't start, it doesn't succeed immediately. It takes 75 years. But after 75 years, uh, the leading uh, rulers, princes, uh, attrition elites of Republics, they've all become, they've all got a human education. Going back to the, to the college and university, do you think that um, 
human humanism in this type of you know formation of character study with this orientation does it have a future in in some parts of uh, college university i think there's going to have to be a major major revolution before before that happens i don't i don't see much hope in colleges frankly i don't want to you know to hold out false hopes uh, but I think where, where the change is going to come is in K-12 education. And that, that could create a kind of demand for this type of education. There are universities that do uh, uh, pride themselves in giving a, a real, um, they call it liberal education or humane education around the country. And if there's a lot of students who are having K-12 students who, are, who, are, who have fallen in love with the classics and want to do something at a higher level, they will find the schools that will offer that. This is the good thing about America is that we do have a very um, pluralistic kind of use where we have a we have a very open education environment. You can come to the school, you can come to the university. Uh, and I think over time there could, there could be changes uh, in the way universities um, teach the humanities uh, and the way universities present themselves to or the kind of offerings that universities give to students who are interested in serious humanities. Um, I think this would be a good uh, final question. Um, are there any books that you would recommend to learn more about the history of humanities education and liberal arts education? Well, um, I have my own book. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I wrote, wrote a book on virtue politics, which is really about the movement to, uh, uh, to I, I, I had, you know, I, this is where I would like to put my mask back on so I don't blush. <laughs> you know, I can't be seen to blush, but I, please I, start, talk a little bit about the book. Well, the book is um, it's very long. But not very good. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to, to, to um, I'm trying to uh, reconstruct the movement of political and, and moral reform in Italy from the 14th the time of the century down to the early 16th century when Machiavelli. And one of the themes of the book, the themes of the book is that Machiavelli was normally taken as characteristic of Renaissance, was not characteristic of Renaissance. So um, the humans were inspired by the ancient ancients like Plato and Aristotle, who believed that character education was prior to uh, political reform. That if you didn't have you could have all the best laws, the best constitutions, the best you know, legal system in the world, but if you didn't have good judges, morally good judges, morally good people writing the laws, morally good people um, as citizens, as you weren't going to have a successful society. One of the famous tags that they like from Tacitus is corruptissima res publica innumerai leges, meaning the more corrupt the republic, the more laws there are. The more the state has to try to control people because they're not controlling themselves, right? So, uh, so that's what the book is really about: the, the movement of moral reform started by the humanities and, and how they, they thought of the humanities as as a transformative um, educational uh, program to create better political leaders. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. What? I'm going to come back to the podium for a second to okay. give people some previews of coming attractions. All right. Hey, well, I thank you for all. Uh, thank you all for coming, um, and to our virtual audience as well. Um, thank you, Professor Hankins, for this illuminating conversation. Um, I want to extend a warm invitation to our next event in the Faith and Works series in only six days, next Wednesday, February 16th at 7.30 Eastern, Dr. Kevin Majors of Harvard Medical School addresses psychological skills and Catholic vision in work. Um, this will be at the St. Paul's Harvard Square campus and also live streamed. Our Sacred Music series continues on Sunday, March 6th at 3.30 Eastern uh, with a choral Vesper service featuring music of North Italy, including Monteverdi's renowned Dixit Dominus at St. Paul's Church and live streamed. Uh, 
St. Paul's Choir of Men and Boys will sing the Vespers, which will be preceded at 2.30 by a lecture and Q&A by Professor Thomas Kelly of Harvard and James Kennedy, Music Director of the St. Paul's Choir School. So please join us either in person or virtually. Uh, check out harvardcatholicforum.org for more information and registration. Support us with a donation. And if you haven't done so, sign up for newsletters to receive announcements of future events. Thank you again for joining this conversation and have a good evening.